I think defining a good bull for your operation is the first step in determining what our budget's going to be. And That's Dr. Mark Johnson with Oklahoma State University Extension back with us to bring into context some very practical insight when it comes to searching for and buying bulls. The longer we're going to own the calves that are bull sires, the more time we have to either suffer the consequences of bad genetics or capture the value of superior genetic potential. So today we'll discuss how you can determine what the value of a good bull is to your operation and the factors you may want to consider in your bull buying decision. That's on today's episode of the Working Ranch Radio Show. Hi again, everyone. This is the Working Ranch Radio Show. I'm Justin Mills, your host, and we're glad to have you joining us on our program today. By the way, if this is your first time tuning in, we want to thank you for doing that, and we hope you enjoy it. Uh, It's always helpful for us, too. If you hear something on the show you enjoy or you like, let us know. Like, hit the like or thumbs up, comments on the show. And if you hear something you don't like, or if you have a question, please feel free to reach out to me. You can do that by getting a hold of me at justin.workingranch at gmail.com. Now, before we jump into our interview real quick, we will have a special interview today as the captain, Tim O'Byrne, who is publisher of Working Ranch Magazine, will join us later on with a special interview that he has. In addition, he will also be giving us his Tim's two cents this week. And of course, meteorologist Don Day will join us towards the end of the program with a look at our long-term weather. Now, as we get back into our subject at hand here today first and foremost i would like to welcome back to our show dr mark johnson with oklahoma state university extension he is their beef cattle breeding specialist and dr johnson thanks for joining us here today on the working ranch radio show it's good to be with you justin well as i told you before we went on air i had such a good response from our last show that you did with us it was back in november of 23 episode 142 entitled cost effective feeding using cowboy math and i i guess what i appreciated about this and our topic that we're even going to get in here today is just the practicality of it is just sitting down and simply doing and you always refer to it this way as kind of some cowboy math and i and i think that's a a good way to look at it we're talking about what What's a what's a good bull worth? And you had written you've written some some white paper on it. You've got some uh, YouTube video on it as well. And I thought in light of where we're at in this time of the year, I realize there's already been several bull sales, but we still have several ahead of us. Just some real practical information that we could look at from uh, as producers when we're starting to evaluate and starting to look through those those bull sale catalogs. And and when we look at that, just in in general, uh, you know, first and foremost, before we start getting into some of the numbers and how much we need to spend just before we get there what are some of the things we need to be looking at first and foremost in these bulls such as you know i mean you know you talked about epds and a a breeding soundness exam i think that's the first characteristic of a good bull justin and that we're buying bulls to get cows bred or heifers bred and so we want a product that whoever's selling it to us is going to stand behind with a breeding soundness warranty of some sort. So typically that would mean that that bull has undergone a breeding soundness exam, that we know that semen quality and quantity is good. All the secondary sex organs, feet and legs, eyes, everything that bull has been deemed functionally sound to naturally mate and service and get cows bred. Mm Mm-hmm. I, I know when we look at the, I mean, first and for, like you said, first and foremost, the the things that are supposed to function need to function correctly, and and I feel in in a lot of ways one of the things that we look at particularly when we're looking at bulls is you know bulls that are going to stand up. When we look at one of the issues in our cattle industry, just in general, is longevity in our cattle herd. Well, we want longevity in our bulls as well. And that's a pretty big part, longevity, which goes back to maybe their feet and their legs, uh, as well as their vigor to get up and breed. Exactly. Libido and servicing capacity, they all go into that. And, you know, the I have likened in the past and in, in these conversations, the life of a good breeding bull or their lifetime in doing it is much similar to probably looking at a professional athlete. 
and, you know, professional quarterbacks in the NFL. I, I kind of draw similarities between the two. Mm-hmm. And you can have a bull that's athletic and sound and fit, and they get injured, and things can happen. And, you know, I always tell this story for every Tom Brady <laughs> who was winning Super Bowls into his 40s, there were quite a few quarterbacks we don't remember their name they might have been talented and capable but some injury along the way they were out of the nfl no longer playing by the time they were maybe 25 or 30 so the life of a breeding bull is similar to that they've got to be athletic they've got to have libido but every time they mount a cow they're on different types of terrain hard ground muddy ground sticks and timber and every mating every natural service when they come down there's the potential to tweak something land wrong and you you injure this joint or that joint and it in some cases can can leave them incapable and so we typically expect several services of breeding out of both several seasons Mm -hmm. several years and I, i think typically bulls are probably on average last until they're five six years of age you'll hear about some people with eight and ten year old herd bulls and you'll also hear some people that a bull was three and he'd had enough and they knew they couldn't count on him anymore so it's there's a lot of perils to that job Mm -hmm. of being a herd bull and injuries do and can happen Mm -hmm. i'm sure as as an extension specialist specifically in breeding cattle What are some of the things that you hear maybe the most in terms of just producers lamenting on their issues that they have had in purchasing bulls? What are some of the top things that you hear from them that, you know, would help other guys and say, may be watching for this or what what do you need to be concerned about? Well, I I think we want bulls that are in good shape. And by good shape, uh, I always liken it to the body condition scoring system we talk about on cows going into calving season. Uh, we'd, we'd like our mature cows to be in the ballpark of a five and a half body condition score and probably our first calf heifers uh, right around a six. And that means they've got the energy reserves to have a calf and get bred back in 80 to 85 days and stay on schedule. And bulls need energy reserves for a different reason. Their motivation and interest is going to change when they get turned out with cows. Uh, Libido is going to kick in. They're going to lose weight. It's a natural part of being a breeding bull during breeding season, whether they're turned out 60 days or 90 days. And so we want to make sure that herd health on those bulls is good. They're properly vaccinated, dewormed, and they're about a body condition score five and a half or six whenever we turn them out with cows, then that should have their batteries charged to go out there and and last through that breeding season. Mm -hmm. And I think if we can accomplish that, regardless of the age of the bull, I mean, if we're turning out yearlings, yes, they've potentially been through a gain test program or some kind of, you know, testing program on farm or ranch or centralized bull tests. But our goal should be to have them at a healthy body condition score six and not overly fat and not overly thin because those young bulls, especially, they're still growing. They're going to need a little better plane of nutrition going through that first breeding season, especially. And as they're still growing and breeding cows at the same time, those yearlings are probably the ones most prone to having a letdown and and losing a lot more weight than they would by the time they're two, three, or four and more at a point of maturity. Mm -hmm. So uh, probably being overly fat, as we think about producer feedback, if they're talking about young bulls in some cases, I haven't heard as much about that in recent years, but going back through time, some bulls that got pushed pretty hard Mm -hmm. and they were maybe just a little overly ripe going into that first breeding season. They'd been on a a higher energy diet, you know, more corn in there and a gain test and uh, accustomed to digesting starch as opposed to fiber and forage. And so, you know, just one of those general rules of thumb, we want to not only make sure that that body conditions about where we want it Mm -hmm. going in on young bulls, but also that their plane of nutrition, what they've been eating has got their rumen bugs set up to go be able to digest grass and live on that same diet that the cows that they're with are going to be living on. Yeah, that that's a good point. That's probably one of the things 
I've heard and even experienced is, you know, bulls that come in over conditioned and, and then fall out quickly. You answered this question a, a little bit ago, but I want to hit it one more time. Kind of the average, what you have found. And I realize we got different parts of the country that we're talking to that have different elements that they're dealing with. But average lifespan of a bull, you said, was about five to six years old. I think that's what we say on average, but I'm always cautioned when it comes to averages. I always say if I'm if I've got one foot frozen in a block of ice, and the other foot standing in a fire, the thermometer in my mouth might say ninety eight point six, but I'm pretty extreme on one half and the other. But yeah, well, I think we would expect several breeding seasons out of a bull, and you know most bulls sell with that breeding soundness warranty one breeding season or one year, mm-hmm. and terms of those things can vary. But if you put bulls in rugged terrain you're probably going to see a shorter life expectancy. You know, in Oklahoma, we have a lot of cow herds that are fall and spring calving. And so they might be using those two, three-year-old bulls on 25 to 35 cows in the spring, pull them in, get them fed back, get them in the right condition, and turn them out again in November, December on a set of fall calving cows. And so the the more you increase the amount of services they're going to do and Those perils we talk about every time they breed a cow, you're probably just increasing the odds that an injury might happen somewhere along the way. Yeah. So I always hate to talk about averages because there are parts of the world where uh, people probably would say, well, my bulls don't last till they're five or six. Mm -hmm. But I think it depends on where you're at, the terrain you're running them in. And in some cases, how many other bulls are they running with? Yeah. Are they are they by themselves in the pasture with? you know, the, the right amount of cows for their age, or are they in really big pastures and lots of bulls running on many, many cows and more potential for fights and injury and stuff like that. So all those things kind of stack the odds against them and potentially decrease that normal life expectancy. Yep, for sure. Well, let's take a break here. And folks, when we come back, we're going to continue. Dr. Mark Johnson with Oklahoma State University is our guest today. And we're going to get into the meat of the program of what I brought him on to. And what's a, a bull worth these days? Uh, what's a good bull worth, I should say? He's going to work through some numbers for us and work through some of what that's going to look like when we come back here on the Working Ranch Radio Show. This segment today brought to you by Diamond V, natural immune support postbiotic feed additives because your animal's health deserves a healthier approach. Find out more at diamondv.com. We'll be back after this. When your goal is to help animals reach their full potential, health matters. Diamond V offers a fresh perspective on animal health, a perspective that supports gut health, strengthens immunity, and enhances performance. For those who choose to invest in keeping healthy animals healthy, feeding Diamond V makes a statement about another dimension of profit where margins are measured by confidence in your future. To get a fresh perspective, visit diamondv.com because animal health deserves a healthier approach. Welcome back to the Working Ranch Radio Show. As we find ourselves here in the front end of the year, it seems like we're always thinking about that next new calf crop that's out there. And I know there's folks have been calving for maybe a month or so and others just getting started and yet others like myself still a ways out from calving. Whether that cow's got a calf at side or whether she's in her third trimester, nutrition for that cow is very critical because if we want a good healthy calf, we know it's going to have to start with a good healthy cow. And a new generation supplements and going to put it simple they have a tub for that and i don't mean that they have a generic tub what i mean is with over 2000 dealers all across the united states and canada they know that the nutritional needs in different parts of the country are critically important which is why they have over 100 different formulas that meet the nutritional demands and the needs for cattle in different parts of the country you know there's plenty to worry about as ranchers and supplements does not have to be one of them i encourage you to stop by your local New Generation Supplements dealer. Now, they're the manufacturer of products like Smart Lick, Mega Lick, and Feed in a Drum. You can learn more about supplements made for successful spring calving season. You can go to their website at NewGenSupplements.com. 
Com. Well, as we get now back into the meat of the matter and our subject at hand today, what's a good bull worth in 2024? My guest today is Dr. Mark Johnson with Oklahoma State University Extension. And Dr. Johnson, with the calf prices up dramatically higher than they were three to four years ago, uh, no doubt the cost of these bulls are probably going to go up as well. But how do we measure that efficiently? How do we know what we should be spending? How does that relate? How can we correlate that back to really the end game, the calves that we have, what we're planning to do with all of those. So let's start from the top of that. How do you determine or figure in, recommend we value a good bull? I'm going to, I'm going to circle back a little bit in answering this one. And the, that article that I write, I update it every year relative to current calf prices and yearling prices and fetch cattle prices. But, uh, you know, the thing I learned back in college close to 40 years ago, a good bull is worth the value of five calves he sires. Now, I don't know that any empirical evidence or any referee journal articles were ever cited when I was taught that. I would have heard that from several professors going through my animal science degree here at OSU. And I've always found it to be a good rule of thumb and kind of an accurate barometer, if you will, of about what a good bull ought to be worth. But I say I'm going to circle back, Justin, because I think defining a good bull for your operation is the first step in determining what our budget's going to be and where we're going to allocate our bull buying dollars. And, you know, in that earlier segment, we talked about, you know, one component of a good bull is that they're going to get your cows bred. Mm -hmm. But that next part of determining a good bull for your operation is where I always say it's it's not a one size fits all thing. We we go to a bull sale, they might be selling a hundred bulls, five hundred bulls. Well, the best bull for one operation that's there may not be one of the top hundred bulls mm-hmm. for another operation that's there. And so you've really got to look at your own beef business and and think about what your resources and management and economics and particularly the intended use of those calves that that bull's going to sire and the marketing endpoint for those calves. And you're looking at bulls, you're kind of thinking about them like an employee you're going to bring into your cattle operation. And what do they have to offer in increasing the profit potential? And that, you know, if we we cut to the bottom line of that, how well do those bulls complement your existing cow herd in order to add value to a set of calves they're going to sire for you. And the answers to to those questions, your operation, your marketing endpoint, your existing cow herd, how do you intend to use those bulls? Or for example, are those bulls going to get used on heifers or are they going to get used on cows? Those things are going to dictate the genetic values and the on-foot type of the bull we identify as a good bull for our operation relative to adding that value to his calf crop. And so I always think we got to do that homework relative to our own unique operation first in identifying what a good bull is going to bring to the table for our operation. And a lot of that, you know, goes into the, the cowboy math, as I always call it, in that arriving at some ideas for what a good bull is worth. Yeah. To me, I feel like uh, we have more tools even today and every year. It seems like some of the technology is providing more tools for us as ranchers to know and find that bull that's going to fit our cattle herd as well. For sure. And we open up a a bull cell catalog or, or we start taking a look at genetic values and we have more of those available to us than we've ever had before. Mm hmm. And yet, when it when we boil it down to what bull best fits our operation and is going to add that value to calves, there's typically only a handful yeah. of traits yeah. where we're going to be able to apply our selection pressure. And, and wherever we want to apply that selection pressure really equates to where we're going to spend our bull buying dollar. Mm-hmm. Yeah, as you say that, it, it makes me think, too, that while I acknowledge and I think it's great that we have a lot of these different selection parts of whether it's our EPDs or genomics that we can search and sort by, we can't get so caught up that we just get drowned in some of that stuff either. We, we really do need to dial in on exactly, as you were saying, what is our intended use of the crop 
for these calves. I agree. So as we move into that, you said, you know, a bull is worth approximately about five calves. That's been a rule of thumb that you've worked on on that. When you look at specifically evaluating our use of the calves, one of the things I thought was interesting was that the longer that you plan on owning the crop, the calves, whatever that may be, the more you could justify spending on a bull. Explain that. Well, we looked at, in that paper, we looked at three marketing endpoints. We looked at the commercial cow-calf operation that is going to market all their calves as wean calves. We looked at it that they're going to hold on to them past weaning, actually run them on grass and turn them into yearlings. So that's their marketing endpoint. Or we looked at a third marketing endpoint. They're going to retain ownership all the way through finishing and sell those cattle either on a live or carcass basis. And the interesting thing about, you know, working through this on a year by year basis, we've got, we're at a different point in the cattle cycle right now than we've been the last couple of years. We're seeing historical highs in value for wean calves in particular. We've just seen a new record on that. I think that broke a 10 year old record Mm -hmm. for five weight calves and, uh, Yearlings are worth good money and fed cattle are worth good money. And if you take a wean calf right now, just say a five weight calf, he's worth over $3 a pound. Those calves are worth $1,700, $1,800 as we cash them in at the sale barn. So if that's our marketing endpoint, we multiply that number by five. That is telling us a good bull right now ought to be worth eight to $9,000 if we sell calves a weaning. Mm Mm-hmm. Now, if we're selling yearlings, if we take the value of a yearling right now and it looks like eight, 900 pound yearlings are bringing well over $2 a pound, well, that equates to a value in those cattle of about $2,000, maybe more. So we multiply that by five. If yearling is our marketing endpoint, a good bull is worth about 10,000 plus. Hmm. Wow. If we take if we take the value of fed cattle right now, uh, fourteen hundred pound steer worth a buck eighty three a pound, we're starting to knock on the door of twenty five hundred to three thousand dollars per head or put mm-hmm. carcass, depending on what they're weighing, and you start seeing bulls take on a value up there around fifteen thousand, hmm. twelve twelve and a half to fifteen thousand, and so in thinking through that and and the point you mentioned. The longer we're going to own the calves that are bull sires, the more time we have to either suffer the consequences of bad genetics or capture the value of superior genetic potential. Mm-hmm. And and that gets particularly interesting if we think about fed cattle, because the majority of fed cattle are sold today on a carcass value basis. Mm-hmm. There are some big fluctuations in the carcass value of a fed steer or heifer right now, depending on quality grade, yield grade combinations relative to their carcass weight. Uh, That old standard that most finished cattle yield a carcass that weighs eight to 900 pounds, we've seen that shift. We're seeing more of these pens of cattle right now being finished out to heavier weights than we've ever seen before. Yeah. And there's, as a result, a thousand, 1100 pound carcasses. You start thinking about the dynamics of grid pricing and high quality grade, yield grade combinations on those. You can you can have a bull take away value or add a lot of value pretty dramatically if you're retaining ownership through finishing. So it just gets back to that concept. And we don't really have the opportunity to even at, think about the the economic repercussions if we're going to keep a set of daughters out of bull. But but that even takes on bigger financial impact. One set of replacement heifers sired by a bull and we're living with the consequences of that bull in our cow herd for the next 10 years. Mm-hmm. And so the longer you're going to own them, the the more economic impact that that good bull has. And using those benchmarks or rules of thumb gives you a feel for what that, you know, return on investment potentially is on that bull that you identify 
brings the most to the table for your operation. Yeah. Well, let's take a break here. I I know every guy that's selling bulls just appreciated what you just talked about here. And all of us as ranchers are taking a big gulp. So when we come back, we're going to talk a little bit more about that when we return here on the Working Ranch Radio Show. Before we head to break, a reminder that this segment brought to you by the American Gelvy Association. You can make your crossbreeding count this year with Gelvy and Balancer Genetics. Find out more at gelvy.org. We'll be back after this. Capitalize on crossbreeding with Geld V and Balancer Bulls. Raise replacement females with added fertility, increased longevity, and greater productivity. Geld V and Balancer influenced females wean more pounds of calf per cow exposed. In the feed yard, Balancer influenced cattle offer increased performance improved feed efficiency and had excellent carcass merit. Balancers add the pounds, make the grade and deliver the value. Make your crossbreeding count with Geld V and Balancer Genetics. Welcome back to the Working Ranch Radio Show. As we continue on, my guest today is Dr. Mark Johnson with Oklahoma State University. And Dr. Johnson, as we were just talking in the last segment, our program initially overall, just talking about what's, you know, what is a bull worth as we see these calf prices going up and what should we be paying, looking in context with how we plan on using the genetics, the offspring out of that bull. You threw some numbers out there, approximately rule of thumb, that is something that you've worked off of for many years. Bull is worth about the five head of calves, the value of five head of calves. And you worked through those different scenarios with us. And as we joked it, as we went on break there, I said all of the guys selling bulls were saying amen to what you said, while all the guys, ranchers like myself, were saying, oh, man. And um, it, how do we bring this into balance? Because that's a big difference. Those prices you talked about, that is a big shift than where we've been at. And at the same time, then we start putting into context the value per breeding as well. And, you know, you start getting ten, twelve, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000. Your cost per breeding is now, you know, in the $80 uh, per breeding uh, for that bull. And so let's bring some of this into context a bit. Well, I, I think, it, again, it gets it helps to get back and take a look at, you know, identifying that good bull for your operation. And when we're talking about using rules of thumb of what they can be worth, everybody's got a budget. And another part of that equation is, is does that bull fit your budget? Mm-hmm. And I'll, I'll give you an example, Justin. I had a question on this from a producer this week. And his marketing endpoint, it's it's a pretty, he's looking for a bull to use on his mature cows, these Rangus bulls that he was considering. And he sells all his calves off wheat pasture as yearlings each spring. And so there's a bull that's got a $3,500 price tag, sells with a breeding soundness warranty. The yearling weight EPD of that bull is 150 so we're using that as a benchmark. Mm-hmm. Thirty five hundred dollar bull yearling weight EPD of one fifty. One fifty is a pretty healthy yearling weight EPD. Mm-hmm. But he's got another bull that he could buy for seventy five hundred dollars. He's got a yearling weight EPD of one eighty two. So we got a thirty two pound difference. Now, to to cut this down to the basic parts, if I've got thirty five hundred as my budget to buy a bull today, I buy the thirty five hundred dollar bull, and I got a bull to get my cows bred. Mm-hmm. But if I look at this as a business model and what this bull has to offer and what is going to be the return on this investment, looking at current prices, and and these are prices we expect to see hold true here for a few years. 32 pounds of weaning weight right now on the USDA market report for Oklahoma this week, conservative value, about 220 a pound. Again, are we talking about 900 pounders, 800 pounders, 1,000 pounders? That's going to be part of this equation. Everybody's going to have to fit in for themselves. But I'm just ballparking a pound of yearling weight at about 220 in value over the lifetime of this bull. Now, I'm assuming these bulls over five years of service are going to end up siring about 150 calves. This is another part of the equation. Producers are going to have to answer this for themselves. What's the life expectancy? How many calves are they going to get out of that bull over his lifetime? But I'm figuring if the bull lasts at least five or six, I should see him sire about 150 calves. Mm -hmm. So that's part of my math. 150 calves, the 182 pound weaning, or excuse me, yearling weight versus 150. 
means that 32 pounds of calf, over 150 calves, worth $2.20 a pound, that $7,500 bull generates me about $10,560 additional revenue over his lifetime. And he's doing that at $4,000 more cost. So the extra 4,000 subtracted from that $10,000 plus, that bull adds about $6,500 over what he's costing over his lifetime as a herd sire as compared to that $3,500 bull. Mm -hmm. Now, again, we can get more conservative with the numbers. Yeah, everybody's got to figure out how many, if somebody only owns 20 cows, then that bull is not going to sire 150 calves for them in the next five years. Yeah. Then your your math becomes maybe siring 100 calves out of those 20 cows. For But that's the kind of numbers I yeah. encourage people to work through in, in figuring out if that bull fits your budget and what he brings to your business model of your cattle operation. Yeah, very good. I think it's very practical. Uh, some key points that I just, as we go through that again is, you know, what's your years? You know, you think you're going to have that bowl or that bowl can stay healthy for you and go on. Keep in mind, some of that's beyond our control, but just in general. And then at the same time, as you said, also, what do we plan on doing with that? What's the, and how long do we plan on maintaining ownership of those cattle? You know, those are two big things that kind of play into this that I see is, am I missing anything? No, I, I think that's it. it. It really gets back to, to looking at your own operation and figuring out the bull that, that offers the most to you for profit potential and bottom line. Mm-hmm. And everybody's, everybody's, operation is going to be unique in that sense yeah and i know one of the things you and i talked about before we went on air here even today was just a little bit when you start looking at some of these costs per breeding i think that's one of the things you do need to break it down to is cost per breeding as you work through that last example with us was very good there is also evaluating especially if you're in a situation where you're wanting to keep replacements is it then evaluating the cost of aiing and again as you and i were talking about that's a whole other ball of wax but it's something you kind of probably should throw in the in some of that context as well don't you think oh i agree if ai breeding if that potential exists in an operation you've always got to consider it but it comes with its own multi-layered questions that you've got to answer Mm -hmm. for your operation as well. It's, you know, we can look at that semen and we might figure we're going to purchase the semen that we're going to need. And, you know, if we figure a a 60% conception rate on AI means we're going to probably need about, if we got a hundred cows, we're probably going to need to start with about 150 straws of semen. We may get that purchase for 10, 20, $30 a straw, you know, prices are going to vary. But then we get into the other considerations of, are we going to synchronize those cows? Yep. All the protocol. How how many times do they need to go through a shoot in order to get synchronized? Uh, If we do that, we're going to confine the amount of time we need to check heat into a shorter period. If we're not going to synchronize them, then we're going to have an extended amount of the breeding season that we're checking heat twice a day. And then we got to catch them and then we've got to have the facilities to get them caught and contained and get them AI bred. And then are we capable of that ourselves, or is that something we're going to have to hire done? And so as you start doing the math and the availability of AI technicians, and what's your time's worth to heat check and what the different things are that you're going to need to do a heat synchronization. There's several layers of costs there Mm -hmm. that you've got to work through in in determining the value of that. Yeah, I think so, too. And I feel, Dr. Johnson, with our conversation here today, I I don't think it's anything that's for a lot of us that we in the back of our minds haven't sort of thought about or worked through. But I feel like our conversation was valuable just in the fact that for some of us or for some folks, it's just a matter of working through that and hearing it come from somebody else to maybe put into place the direction we need to be looking at. And as I said before we went on air, sometimes I felt in in years past, some guys have spent way too much on bulls and there's probably some people that spend way too less than they should on bulls. And really this whole thing just in general is just helping us to identify where should we be at. Yeah. And and gets back to, is it the right bull? Yeah. And that price point I think is always relative to identifying the right bull, the best fit for your operation. And 
that's going to influence that price that you're going to invest in genetics and determining what that price point is. You bet. Well, I appreciate you taking the time to do this and sit down with me here on this and uh, and appreciate your insight on this topic. I enjoyed it, Justin. I appreciate you reaching out. You bet. And again, Dr. Mark Johnson with Oklahoma State University Extension. My guest here today is their beef cattle breeding specialist. If you want to find out more information, you can go to their website at extensionokstay.edu. And keep in mind, I, I will also put a link in the show notes that you can find by going to the podcast site as well. And uh, some very useful information, like I said. It's probably something that for most folks, maybe you've done a little penciling on that, but I think it's always good to review this topic and just see where we're at so that we're in line with our goals and plans of what we want to see our herd accomplish and get to as we move forward in each of our ranching operations. We'll stay with us when we come back. The Captain Tim O'Byrne, publisher of Working Ranch Magazine, will step in for a special interview while he was down at the 2024 Cattle Convention in Orlando. We'll check in with him coming up next and later on in the show, meteorologist Don Day will be in as we take a look at our long-term weather. We'll be back after this. Welcome back to the Working Ranch Radio Show. If you remember back the end of January, first part of February, the 2024 Cattle Convention was taking place down in Orlando, Florida this year. And the Captain Tim O'Byrne was there with Working Ranch Magazine, as he is each and every year, to take in all of the activities, the events that were there. In fact, if you remember, when he chimed in for that week's edition of Tim's Two Cents, he was a bit overwhelmed with all of the new things he was seeing there on the floor of the trade show. And while he was was there. He was able to sit down and catch up with Dr. Jason Nickel with Merck Animal Health. Let's listen in now on that conversation. Doc, always a pleasure to have you on the show. Tell us what's going on with Merck Animal Health. You got something new cooking? Yeah, Tim, no, thanks for the opportunity. And yeah, we always have new things cooking. Our biopharma uh, portfolio continues to expand and, and that segment of the business continues to be there and will continue to innovate in that area. However, we are expanding our business beyond bi- biopharma and into the animal monitoring realm. And so specifically where I find myself focusing a lot of my time is in the feed yard segment. And with that, the product uh, SenseHub Feedlot. What's that sense hub? So that's that's part of the monitoring arm that you're kind of expanding into, correct? Exactly. And so sense hub is really nothing more than just the the umbrella, if you will, of the of the product line. But what this encompasses, Tim, is a is a product that is in the form of a wearable device in the form of an ear tag okay. that collects animal activity and temperature simultaneously. Mm-hmm. And we use artificial intelligence techniques to to ultimately tell us, is that animal different than how it has behaved historically, but also is it different than the group? And so what we're looking for is outliers in, in the population. And the whole premise behind this is that, especially when it comes to bovine respiratory disease, which is our number one issue, health issue, in, a, in that post wean beef calf, we, we know from experience that our ability to find that is overwhelmed by the animal's ability to hide. Yeah. And so if that makes any sense. It does, so, does, yeah. You're right. Prey, so, prey, prey predator. Exactly. They are a prey species, and the last thing that they want to do is convey weakness. And so they will conceal clinical signs of, of illness or lameness or whatever the case may be. And so the whole objective of this system is to, it's never going to be perfect but by any means, but we want to improve upon our ability to find that animal early and accurately with the whole goal of improving treatment response. So I'm intrigued when you say it's sensing different, like the differentiation in the, in the normal behavior or the behavior recorded. That can also be a low temp as opposed to just a spiking hot temp, which a lot of us know that, you know, that have checked pens and done a lot of treatment shoot side can say, you know, just because I pull him and it's he comes in at 100.7 doesn't mean he's healthy. That could be actually, you know, significant downward trend. And that would, that would alert on this the system it, it would and so as long as that animal is is shown to be an outlier to itself and to the group yeah it that you know it would be flagged and so to your point exactly this is not a brd specific 
product. And so we are looking for anything that's an outlier that's different. Yeah. And so we will, you know, we do see lamenesses get picked up. You know, there'll be, I'm very confident that what we're capturing at times where it's flagging an animal and it, to your point, does not have an elevated rectal temperature. A lot of times we're probably dealing with some ruminal acidosis issues. Right, right. Right. And so, you know, it, this goes beyond just treating the infectious disease side of things. There's probably an opportunity in here to just cast a wider net and keep, in, you know, have more eyes across the entire production system as well. So we've always been, especially in Jason, we talked about this, you know, feedlots have always interested us and a lot of our listeners and readers. The the Merck Whisper was just a, I mean, what a great idea and a great premise for that. Does it interface with this? It would interface with this. They don't, they don't piggyback off of one another, but that information can be used in tandem. But to your point on interfacing, the, the sense of feedlot system will integrate with existing animal health shoot side software. And so honestly, we really try to, if there is software there to integrate, if we can, because it does streamline the data entry process and, you know, just make things much easier for the, for the user. Jason, on a broader scope of things, what would you, now you're, you're out and about, you see a lot of things, you talk to a lot of people. What kind of sense for 2024, and I'm talking about in the animal health end of it, you know, what kind of recommendation would you give us to say, you know, I think you guys ought to really take a look at this or we should be watching for this coming down the highway. What's kind of at the top of your mind to answer that question? Yeah, no, there's, you know, there's, there's, if we had it all figured out, we wouldn't be talking about this, right? Yeah. So, I, you know, I think first and foremost is, for at least from our standpoint, is that we want to continue to build on the on the early success of Sense Up Feedlot and continue to expand that, continue to expand our ability to, you know, provide value to those individuals. I think I would, you know, in my mind, you know, well, and, and just taking a step back across the board, whether it be feedlots or swine production or poultry production or dairy production, labor is a consistent oh, issue, yeah. you know. It is. And so, you know, being able to utilize the system, not to reduce labor by any means, but is there an opportunity to get a, can, can we do a better job, and I'm talking about us internally, can we do a better job at estimating how products like Sense Up Feedlot can help optimize labor? Right. And so, you know, does that can we find ways to where we can use that technology to not have to rely on the training or the experience that we want that we that we have up to this point? But can we rely on someone that may not have the background, but is still willing or and able to go out and, you know, go get the animals that the system is 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 alerting as well as doing other stuff? in addition to that. Yeah, the Whisper is a prime example of that. I'm helping out shoot side at the feed yard to do your diagnostic right there. It's such an in-depth tool for that. Recently, I guess it was last June, July, I went to Calgary to the Beef Improvement Federation uh, meeting and we did a tour of a feed yard in Alberta there. And I got to tell you, the help was absolutely number one. I mean, we watched them process, we watched them re-implant some really heavy cattle, maybe nine weights, and they were such a great crew to work. I mean, it was just, it was just textbook, not a peep out of them and just boom, boom, boom. So I am optimistic that there are the people out there, but if the technology technology is going to jump in and help them achieve excellent results. That just makes their job easier. And it's great for the feed yard and great for the beef production line in general. Yeah, no, no doubt. And so, you know, that, like you said, the, you know, the, the folks are out there, it's, it's one attracting them and retaining them. And so if we can, if we can help streamline their, their job and their day, mm -hmm. you know, our feeling is that we can, we can help sustain that, that that labor force but at the end of the day we are very sensitive to the fact that they can see these technologies as potential threats too and and that is not where we want that to be viewed and so we're very quick to say this is not something that is should be perceived as a threat but rather as another tool in your toolbox yeah absolutely and it, i think once the folks get the hang of what we're talking about here that it is a tool 
they're confident it's not going to, you can't replace them. I mean, you still got to get out there and write pants. You still got to get them to work the shoot and stuff. So, yeah, absolutely. Doc, thank you so much for coming on the radio show. No, Tim, my pleasure. Thanks again and best wishes. All right. All right. Thanks, Captain, for that interview, that update. Always interesting to hear some of the new and innovative things that are coming down the line from some of these companies. And no doubt, some of the products that you talked about there with Merck Animal Health will be very revolutionary to our industry and appreciate you bringing that to us here on the Working Ranch Radio Show. Let's take a break here. And when we come back, meteorologist Don Day will join us as we take a look at that long-term weather and the captain will be back with us for this week's edition of tim's two cents as well we'll be back after this Fascinated by our wild weather? Now you can learn, appreciate, and understand the weather in your own backyard with the new Tropo Rain Gauge. Having achieved the highest rating of any product reviewed by the WeatherStationExperts.com, the Tropo boasts rugged durability, impeccable accuracy, and precision to the hundredth of an inch. Visit MeasureRain.com to order a Tropo today and use code RAINDAY, that's R-A-I-N-D-A-Y, for free shipping and 10% off. Go to Measure rain.com and welcome back to the working ranch radio show as we're joined now by meteorologist don day with a look at our long-term weather and don as we find ourselves at least in our neck of the woods having this first wave of march weather coming through more in the northern tier of the country and up into southern canada but as we look ahead into this next week this next wave is going to be centered kind of through the middle portions of the u.s yeah, we've got a very busy Pacific, and it's going to be churning out multiple fronts, multiple storm systems. And just, uh, you know, you had mentioned southern Canada from Alberta through Saskatchewan and Manitoba. This is going to be one of their bigger snow events of the season before it's all said and done. And this is going to be followed up by, I wouldn't call it, let's say, a, a single system, but multiple systems that are going to be coming out of the northern Pacific through the Aleutians, through the Gulf of Alaska, then coming into the Pacific Northwest and the West Coast. And what's left of these storms will then go west to east across the USA. So March is going to be a a very busy month, at least the beginning of it. Yeah. And what is really interesting to watch this is the amount of moisture that the west of the Continental Divide is getting. And it really is centered right over the key snowpack areas that are really reliant on that moisture later in the summer. Yeah, the the snow that's going to fall in the mountains of California, uh, Utah, Nevada, Wyoming, northern and southwest Colorado, Idaho, and into Montana is going to be very, very significant over the next 10 days. Now, the northern the northern Rockies, their their snowpack has been well below average. It continues to be that way, but they're going to get a boost. You're going to need not just a yardstick to measure the snow in the Sierra Nevada You'll need multiple yardsticks. Uh, one uh, thing that I looked at uh, before we got on air here was uh, showing the potential for over 10 inches of water, potentially that much could fall over the next 10 days in the Sierra Nevada up high. You know, that that's going to equate uh-huh. to upwards of 10 feet of snow. Oh, my word. Yeah, that's that's your like you said, it's going to take yards, not feet to measure that as this progresses, as we see these waves. And you had mentioned that, I believe, even last week when we were talking about that, you were really seeing the the March being kind of these waves of storms coming through. What's that going to look like as far as we move out? Is it going to be, you know, a couple, three days of a storm and then we kind of break a bit? What are you anticipating it to look like? Yeah, that's a good way to describe it, because what you do is you you get into a little bit of a roller coaster pattern where not one particular pattern sets up for a long period. So you'll have a storm in the front. You'll get colder and wet and windy. Then you're going to have a few days where it's going to warm up quite a bit. This is where your backyard thermometer, that thermometer you have on the back porch there, gets a big workout because you do tend to see the pendulum swing. Because what these Pacific systems will do, and we saw this last week, with the really warm air, they can put they can push out really warm air ahead of them, then bring a sharp drop in temperature behind them. So you get this vacillating up and down pattern, and this is really going to be developing west to east and affecting most of the lower 48 in southern Canada uh, through the first two to three weeks of the month. What it does lead to is it does lead to many opportunities for folks to get precipitation, and we're hoping that some of those dry areas uh, in parts of the Midwest, Corn Belt, 
uh, will be able to pick up some precipitation. They probably will. Yeah. And I know that's generally the talk that I'm having as I visit with people or people are visiting with me is uh, we've appreciated the mild winter, but knowing at some point we're going to need some moisture. And uh, that's kind of one of the things we're thinking about. Real quick, just an update on El Nino. I know uh, it's starting to fade a bit. Uh, is it on course, on track with the timing that you suspected? Yeah, and 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 we are certainly going to be looking at it fading rather rapidly over the next two or three months. Now, it's not going to become a La Nina right away. We're going to go into a neutral phase. But one thing that we watch is the depth of the warm water near the equator. And uh, it is getting very, very shallow. And there's some colder water below that's coming on up. Uh, but there's a lot of Pacific. That is a very large stretch of ocean between South America and north of Australia where we watch this. So it's going to be a process that's going to evolve slowly, but we're going to be able to put the nail in the coffin of this El Nino probably in about six weeks or so, if not beforehand. Then we're going to be watching whether or not El Nino comes late summer or fall. So things have not changed in terms of the timing. Okay. All right. Well, Don, appreciate it. We'll check in with you next week. Thanks. Sounds good. And again, that is meteorologist Don Day with a look at our long-term weather. You can find him each and every morning on his daily video YouTube podcast. Uh, You can go to his website at dayweather.com and you can get a link from there. Well, the captain, Tim O'Byrne, is standing by. He is publisher of Working Ranch Magazine. Let's check in with him now for this week's edition of Tim's Two Cents. Hey, Justin. Hey, everybody out there in Working Ranch Radio Land. These wildfires down in Texas heading into Oklahoma. Uh, just absolutely horrific. Somebody texted me a map of the Smokehouse Creek fire. It's 93 miles long and 20 to 34 miles wide in some places. That's a lot of country. I got to tell you, um, folks are hauling hay in from all over the place and, and, and trying to do what they can. And that's what I love about this, this rural ranching community we got here. Uh, we are always there to help each other out. It doesn't matter how far away you are. If you need us, we're there to help you. There's plenty of places to donate uh, materials and cash to help folks out. It's going to be a while before we get this thing all figured out, but uh, God bless and good luck on all that, everybody. And um, Justin, uh, on your last episode, you had attorney Dal Houston on again. I'm, I really dig it when you have these guests, these uh, these very qualified guests coming back periodically. That gives me a chance as a listener to kind of connect to them and, and learn who they are over time. And I, I, I really like that. And also, I think it enables you to really have a rapport with them and cut straight to the chase. And, and this is why this is what I love about your podcast radio show. And um, I did have a question about last week's episode on the estate tax and that. Now, we, we were talking about the federal uh, estate tax laws, but there's also in some states, they'll have a state estate tax law that some folks can't quite get around. So I, I would like a little bit more clarification on that. Maybe we could find somebody to come on the show and explain that or some sort of a anecdote where it's like, well, we thought we had it uh, wrapped up on the federal level, but the state turned around and and uh, slapped us with a big one. So let's figure that one out for the folks. And um God bless everybody out there. Just be safe. Back to you in the booth. All right. Thanks, Captain. We'll take a look into that uh, regarding the state issues on estate taxes that uh, might be different out there than some of the federal things. See if we can't get an answer on that. Now, in regards to the very first thing you brought up, Captain, I'm glad you did because it was something I was thinking about and meant to mention that earlier on the show. And I'll tell you, you folks down in Texas and Oklahoma dealing with those wildfires, just please know that all of us here in the ag industry, our hearts and thoughts and our prayers, especially going out to you all and wishing you the very best as you make your way through that. And uh, boy, I tell you, it's heartbreaking to see that and also very proud of our industry for stepping up and helping each other out. But we wish you the very best and prayers going to you guys dealing with those wildfires. We're going to take a break. When we come back, I'll tell you what's in store for next week's edition of the Working Ranch Radio Show.
Coming up on next week's show, if you run cattle, my guess is you've probably had to deal with this, and that's lameness in your livestock. Dr. Lacey Farmar will be joining us as we're going to be talking about that, so be sure to tune in on next week's edition of the Working Ranch Radio Show. Well, the Working Ranch Radio Show is a production of Working Ranch Magazine, branded number one by America's Ranchers. Now, if you'd like to get a hold of me, it's pretty simple. My email address is justin.workingranch at gmail.com. Thanks for joining us. I'm Justin Mills, and until next time, keep your chin down and your mind in the middle. So long.